There were also great advances made in science. In, remember, we're in Europe, 1750 to 1914. Remember, we're in Europe. And I just have a question to give two famous thinkers of this time. One of them is Charles Darwin. In 1859, he, he uh, publishes a book called The Origin of Species. And essentially, what he says is animal plant life uh, evolve over time from earlier forms. And he says nature works through random struggle. Uh, there is a struggle between species t for survival. In other words, what Darwin said is there's only so much resources out there. There's only so much food. There's only so much uh, land, water, and species have to compete for this. And those who are best able to survive under whatever circumstances they are, um, will emerge the long-term winners. Now, sometimes that gets, uh, ex some people interpret that as you're the best species, that's why you survive. It doesn't always mean best, it means best suited for whatever that environment is. For instance, none of us would consider a dung beetle who lives off elephant poop in the savannas of Africa, none of us would consider that a particularly great life. But they are the best suited for eating poop. And so they survive and make it from generation to generation. Another great thinker of this time, although he overlaps the two, really starting in the early 1900s and continues on over past 1914, is Albert Einstein and his theater, theory of, relativity, of relativity. I'm sorry. He adds the notion of time. Now, there was something called, I don't know if you guys have probably heard of it, the Zeno's Paradox. He was an ancient Greek thinker. I'm sorry, I never put this on full screen. Um, Zeno's Paradox. And Zeno's Paradox said the following. He s it said that in order to get from point A to point B, you've got to go halfway. And once you reach halfway between point A and point B, you go halfway again towards point B and then halfway again, and halfway again, and halfway again. And the bottom line is you will never reach point B because you always must go halfway between the two points before reaching the end point. And you people were, the paradox was, yeah, we do make it from point A to point B. So how could we make it from point A to point B if Zeno's paradox suggests we never should? Well, Einstein said that's really simple. We've got time. Our, if you're looking at it as a three-dimensional world, uh, depth, height, uh, and width, a three-dimensional world, he said our world is not three-dimensional. It's actually four, four dimensions. And the fourth dimension is the notion of time. And time allows us to get to, from point A to point B. Um, so this was the big thing of Einstein. Of course, there's a backlash against all this. There's the Romantic movement. And the Romantic movement said, um, essentially, that we're reacting back against all this science and logic. And we say that art, at least in art, everything should be based upon our emotional response to it. A romanticism, I've defined the term there, is emotion, impression are more important than reason and generalization. You'd had artists take, for instance, the area of music like uh, Mozart, Amadeus Mozart, and Mozart was very technical, very math oriented. And then along comes a guy like Beethoven. And Beethoven was very much about eliciting emotions out of music, bringing out your feelings, bringing out your emotions. And probably one of the, the main novels of this time that explores this dilemma is the novel uh, by Mary Shelley called Frankenstein. Frankenstein explores what happens when man starts to interfere in nature and create life himself, sort of like playing God. And is that good? Is there a line where science goes too far, uh, where science and human rationality uh, mix up nature and actually make it worse um, instead of better. And so that was a romantic movement, very much based on uh, emotion. Our poets, romantic poets, and it doesn't mean romantic as in, oh, I love her. She's so special and so wonderful. It meant romantic in the sense that we're dealing with our emotions. Uh, poets were to write poetry in the heat of the moment, the heat of the passion of the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. And that would bring 
out your true greatness in poetry. Next up, uh, Western settler societies. The other thing that's going on in the 1800s is Europe is back on the move again. We're start, they're starting to move. They're starting to move into places like Australia, New Zealand, of course, India. But India is not really a major settler society. Settler society means there are going to be large numbers of Europeans going there. So the question is, why? Why send people to Australia? Well, first of all, you want new markets for your processed goods. Um, number two, it created commercial agriculture in other regions to satisfy Europeans' need for raw materials and agricultural products. What do I mean by that? Well, as European industry takes off in the 1800s, Europe sees its population skyrocket. And in many cases, this is before fertilizer, um, or at least the more advanced nitrogen fertilizer, in the 1800s, they need to import food. So what better than to find agricultural places, someplace else in the world, where they can grow food and bring it back to Europe. Also, communications, steamships, railroads, uh, the telegraph system have all made communication and transportation easier. It's facilitated expansion. Also, nationalist rivalries. How would nationalistic rivalries do this? Well, if you're sitting in Britain and you hear France has gained a new colony in Africa, well, you don't want to get beaten by the French. So what do you do? Well, you go try to grab a colony of your own. Business people see this as a new chance for profit, new markets, new places to sell, new places to buy from. And it leads to a massive European immigration to certain places, not everywhere, but to certain places. And we'll talk about some of those places. Okay, but before I get to those, let me just say this um, here, but you've got the, also in the late 1800s, you've got the emerging power of the United States. First hundred years, the U.S. remains relatively isolated. We're a weak lane compared to some of the European nations, and we just want to be left alone. But the event that will kick it off for us and be really a pivotal, pivotal moment in U.S. history will be the Civil War. It's the Industrial North versus the Agricultural South, and this warfare will accelerate America's industrialization. Okay, but back to the other thing. What are some of the places where Europeans settle in large numbers in the 1800s? They will settle in the United States, yes. Yes, they will settle in the United States. You'll see a large number of European immigrants come to the United States. Also, you'll see a large number of them go to places like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And what were the connection among these three settler places? All of them, and that's why, notice we don't throw the United States in here, because they're all agricultural. U.S. in the late 1800s is moving towards industrialization. Um, so these necessitate exchanges with England. There are themes of liberalism, uh, socialism in the sense that uh, we do have social safety nets, uh, insurance for the poor, and those kind of things. We'll see modern art, and European science goes there. They received new waves of immigrants during the 19th century, during the late 1800s. All of these places, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, will see movement. New Zealand, for example, will see a large movement of Irishmen there. Um, during the starvation of the Catholic Irish uh, at least somewhat on purpose by the British in the 1800s. Many of them will head that way. Um, and industrialization can lead to rapid colonization. Why? Well, industrialization means we have larger steamships, larger iron ships, and so we will see people moving into these parts of the world. All right, we'll take a quick break and come back and grab the rest of the lecture.